Well, hello, hello, and welcome back. I'm sure you enjoyed your first networking break. And this is presenting our sponsors. And I will ask you to give them a massive round of applause because nothing is ever happening without our sponsors. So our premium gold sponsors, Unicredit Bull Bank and New Horizons Bulgaria. I think you can do louder than this, but uh, our exhibitor sponsor, ITCE. The premium silver sponsors, Telelink, Melexis, and Atos. Our premium bronze sponsors, Inequality and SBTech. <laughs> and the jewel in the crown. This is our premium diamond sponsor, Sensata Technologies. <laughs> At this point, the audience should go wild. <laughs> yes, thank you, guys. Thank you, Kos. Sensata Technologies, they're supporting us for two consecutive years now. And I can tell you a little secret. They promised that they will support us for the next two years as well. So one more time, give it one up for Sensata. One more time. Thank you. Thank you to our sponsors. Now we move forward to our next presentation, which again, I'm sure will be very interesting to Bob. It will show in fun and interactive way how we need to adjust our thinking and adapt to the new features of technically advanced project management. Our next guest is project management and agile professional with broad experience across several industri yes. industries. <sighs> industries. Uh, he's head Agile <laughs> Method Center of Excellence at Bristol Myers Squibb and is an adjunct professor at Villanova University. Past president of PMI Delaware and skillful presenter in several countries for over 15 years now. It is a pleasure for me to introduce Mr. Michael Paladino. Welcome him on stage. Hello. Hello, welcome. Dobre doshi. So, the, uh, there we go, I was waiting for my slides. I was very excited when I heard the opportunity to come speak here in Bulgaria. And I said, I keep hearing about robots and the fourth industrial revolution. I said, wow, that's exciting, isn't it? I know. That's kind of the excitement I get in the crowd. But I said, we finally get our flying cars, right? Didn't everybody want flying cars? I'm super excited about that. I finally get to go to Mars and see other planets. I finally get the body I've always wanted. I'm ready to go. I'm excited about the future. This is good. I said, I need to do some very good in-depth research. Let me understand about the future and robots and, and see what I can learn. So I watched a movie. Right? That's what we do. I said, let me watch The Matrix. Let's see what we learned from it. It won a lot of awards. We learned a lot about what the future is going to be. What happens to the humans, right? What happens to the humans in the, the, the movie? We all become batteries. Not very, not very exciting, is it? So that is the conclusion of my presentation. We all become batteries. And uh, it's kind of depressing, isn't it? I didn't like that. So that's what the movie told me, is there's nothing we can do. That's our future. I said, no, I don't like that. I don't like that answer. Let me do some more research. I need to watch more movies, right? <laughs> and I told my wife, I said, honey, I have, to, I have to do research. This is great. She was very excited. She said, yes, honey, I love you. This is for your business. I'm here to support you. Anything you need from me, I will support you. Yeah, that was the look I had when I said I had to do research. But what were the results of all those different movies that I, wa I did not watch all the movies? But what, you start looking at all the different stories we hear about of the future. 539 movies I found. Out of all those movies, they almost all have a negative outlook. 532 all have a very bad, sad, depressing view of the future. How many are happy? There's our math seven. I know, isn't that funny? That's Hollywood. I apologize for America, for the, the movies we produce. But it got me to think a little bit. And I said, there's got to be more to our future. There's got to be more to the value we bring as humans. We heard a little bit of that earlier today. We bring some randomness, creativity, uh, excitement. We're very good at managing unstructured data. 
this is a lot of what we do, we're very good at adapting to our environment. We've done that over the centuries. We adopt to new change, at least hopefully we do. And that's how we thrive in the future. That's how we keep ourselves from becoming batteries in the future. There's a lot of different areas that are still very difficult to automate. We hear a lot about robots and automation and chatbots and all these things. But some of these areas have very, very low penetration for robots, such as chiropractors, makeup artists, um, certain choreography, art directors. This is an area that we just don't have that capability yet. Certainly anything that deals with social perception of people, how we interact. Certainly that desire that we bring. I want to run a business. I want to own my own company. Um, computers just don't have that built in unless we program them or tell them. But they're still asking for humans to tell them what to do. So what I think we need to do is stand up for all humans. Do not go gently into that good night. It's one of famous uh, quotes. Or we just close the door. This was an interesting article in the Wall Street Journal last year, how to survive a robot apocalypse. You close the door. Robots today still are, have a very difficult time opening a door. <laughs> and not my article. They, they wrote it. So they're, they're very good at math, but they're not very good at the hand-eye coordination. Just this past year, I was reading some things about algorithms. And as we teach robots, we still have to add more and more humans to help robots understand what data to use, how to interpret the data, and support it. And it's not clear, are the robots learning, or are they simply just following directions? This was in interesting last year as well. Facebook had to add an additional 10,000 people. We keep hearing about all of their automation and how they're simplifying a lot of what Facebook does. Um, they, they keep adding more people to help support the company in terms of all of their automation. And what we're finding is a lot of times the programs don't necessarily learn the way we think of humans learning. We don't understand how we learn ourselves. But certainly it's a lot of pattern recognition. I'm going to share two uh, articles as well. The first one in the New York Times in the, in the US, Labor versus Machines. It's an employment puzzle. Revolutionary decade in machinery. We're going to discard man in history. Another article about the president ranks automation as a job challenge, the burden of finding work for all of these people that are going to be replaced by machines. The only problem is, this was written in 1930. <laughs> this one was written in 1962. We've been talking about this for decades, many, many years about how automation is coming and taking over. An article I found in 1928. We were worried about concrete, like cement for buildings. People were panicked. Wow, machines can mix this automatically without humans mixing the cement. It's going to be the end of the world. What do we do with all of these jobs? That's what we were worried about in 1928, almost 100 years ago. But let's talk about the past. Sometimes we forget about the past. A lot of different industrial revolutions that have occurred in the past, steam, water, labor, electricity, but it's produced many different products. Sewing machines, printing presses, radios, all of these amazing discoveries. I always find it when people protest the future, but yet they're on their phones talking about how they want to protest the future. That is the future in their hands. So it's an interesting approach. But what happened to a lot of those previous jobs as we've gone through these other industrial revolutions? So let's talk about the great crises of 1900 in New York City. I'm sure we talk about this every day. There's 200,000, back in 1900, they had 200,000 horses in the city. If you start doing a little bit of math, um, yeah, they create quite a bit of waste. About the size of a small child every day. Um, kind of, we add that up, we, we talk about how many millions of kilograms per day. You need to clean that up every day. So you didn't think you were coming to this presentation today, did you? <laughs> this was not the topic you thought we were going to cover. In 1880, they had 15,000 horses died 
And in many cases, they didn't even clean up the horses afterwards. It wasn't very nice. But what, think about all those amazing new jobs that were created by horses, right? We had to make the wagons, the horseshoes. There was a job in New York. You had to sweep just to be able to clear the manure to walk across the street. You actually had to tip somebody to, to do that. That's where we were 100 years ago, 120 years ago. 1908, cars came. The panic started. What are we going to do with all these people? What are we going to do with all these jobs? What we always hear about, new technology comes along, we're going to lose all these jobs. That's usually the message we hear most of the time. But what also happens is we create new technology, new industries, that creates new jobs. Many of us are in many of those new jobs. What else happens? We get higher productivity, one of two things occur. We expand the company, or we have lower prices, sometimes both. When we expand, we create new jobs. When we have lower prices, sometimes we buy more, which helps the company expand and we get new jobs. Or we'll buy other things. I'm almost done. If you're going to take a photo, it's coming up next. Here you go. We buy other things, which also create more jobs. Interesting. But what do we hear about? All the jobs that we lost. I'm sweeping the floor. Think about that. Let's put it another way. Let's look at the autos. Cars came along. All of these jobs were lost of making the wagons. But what did we create since then? New materials, the way cars are made of today, the different plastics and fiberglass. Tires, our roads, our street signs, all these were new that were not here 100 years ago. Certainly hotels, fast food restaurants, that may not be so good, but fast food restaurants, tourist vacations, travel. I'm here, I was able to travel how many thousands of miles? I think it's 4,800 miles to be here because of modern technology. You can tell me at the end if that was a good thing or a bad thing, that's okay. With Cars, let's add a little, do a little bit of math with cars. We keep hearing about what? Automated cars, automatic driving cars. It's coming, it's going to be what, tomorrow, next week, any day now? Let's do a little bit of math. In Bulgaria, how many cars do we have on the road? About four million cars. In Bulgaria, it's about 1% per year people buy new cars. About 38,000 new cars per year. So let's do the math. How long will it take until we convert completely to driverless cars? <laughs> At my age, I'm not too worried about it. <laughs> but imagine if only half the people buy a driverless car. We have about 200 years. In the United States, the numbers are about 70 years until we have, everything is replaced. So I'm not worried about the automated cars. I'm wondering, what do we do for the next 105 years in Bulgaria when we have both automated cars and humans on the road driving at the same time. That's the concern. <laughs> Let's talk about sewing machines. Again, something you probably were not expecting to talk about today. Some of the early machines, we always hear about Singer as the, the brand, but there was other machines that were created. Patents are so important. Women, I'm sorry, it was mostly women at the time. But women, when they had to sew 14 hours to make one shirt. Can you imagine that? That was what your day was, 14 hours to make a shirt, 10 hours to make a dress. I don't know why that, well, I guess it was faster. Pants, three hours. Sewing machines came along. I certainly cut the hour down, down to about an hour to make a shirt. It's amazing productivity. But what's also, and again, I'm sure in Bulgaria, every single day you talk about the great sewing machine riots of 1830. I was out in the hallway. We had that conversation today. I went down and did the free Sofia tour yesterday. That's all they talked about, the great sewing machine riot. <laughs> so as part of that, in, back in France, uh, Bartholomew uh, Timonier, he had a factory in 1830. He said, I'm going to be smart. I'm going to take 80 sewing machines, put them in the room. I'm going to do mass production. And then what happened is a lot of the French tailors came and burnt down his machine. We don't want the future. We don't want this. We're going to lose our jobs, which was mostly true. After that, what happened? Mostly everyone has a sewing machine in their home. How about today? Who still has a sewing machine that you actively use in your house? I see you back there. One, two, three, four, five, six, that's it. What happened? Here's an industrial revolution that came and went. We're, we're completely on the other side of that one. 
Today, I think we own more than one or two shirts, right? Because it's cheap, it's quick, it's easy. I wouldn't imagine going back and having just sew my own shirts. So part of the challenge we have is predictions, the future. Most predictions are always scary, but we have to take them in context. Um, many times we don't see and understand the big picture. A couple different phrases here, right? If we forget our past, we're doomed to repeat it. The other challenge is if we only look at a very small set of data, we can make a very wrong conclusion. Where's my uh, statisticians and my uh, economists in the room? So what if we only look at data from the last few months? Let's see what happens, okay? I'm going to give you an example. Panic! The great sunlight crisis. Now, you're supposed to be worried. You're supposed to be afraid. Because starting in June, we're starting to lose two minutes of sunlight every single day. That's scary. I, ran a, I, did a, I, I had an artificial intelligence. I did a ro robot. I did some calculations. We're going to have total darkness by July if we continue this trend. It affects the entire northern hemisphere, not just Bulgaria. I thought it was just Bulgaria, but it's actually everywhere in the northern hemisphere. But I found out where it's going. It's leaking to the southern hemisphere. <laughs> They're gaining two minutes per day. What do we always hear from our politicians and the newspapers? We have to do something. What's usually the next response they say? Give me some money. If you pay me today, give me some money, I'll fix this problem by December. I'll reverse the trend for you. It's okay, don't panic. That's the challenge when we only look at a very small set of data. It's, it's very easy to have these really crazy predictions that, that occur. I know, isn't it silly? So I'm sure, too, we all remember from 40 years ago about the paperless society. Are we there yet? That was supposed to be within three or four years. I still see a lot of paper out there. Yeah, it's getting better, but I used to work for a company that stored paper. That was their only job, Iron Mountain, store paper. They were growing 2% every year still today. They're still storing paper, and their business is still growing. It's amazing. Um, I'm sure you also remember the laborless kitchen. Certainly in the US right now, the trend is huge, having big, massive, fancy kitchens so we can cook at home again. Somehow we lost the tradition to cook. People would eat out many times. Now in the US, the trend is going back to the kitchen. We also have a very poor track record of predicting the future. So Wall Street Journal, it's a financial newspaper in the United States and certainly elsewhere. Every six months, they take all of the economic data and they want to make one prediction. In six months, is the economy going up or is the economy going down? Not by how much, just up or down. Very simple, right? They have all that data out there. It's amazing the amount of data that they have. Their accuracy? <laughs> 52%. Coin toss, yes. What about professional stock pickers? This one scared me. As a joke, this was a few years ago, they asked some monkeys, some monkeys to throw darts at the wall and, and predict the future of the stocks. The results? In most times, the monkeys did better throwing the, throwing the darts versus the professionals that you pay them money. You shouldn't be laughing. You're paying these people money to, to buy your stocks and, and retirement, and monkeys can do it better. Go buy a monkey, it's cheaper. <laughs> so I'm going to use a American football. I apologize, it's not, I won't say the word soccer and all the football and all these other variations. But the American football, we have different divisions. There's four teams per division. Actually, I have to do it this way, right? We're four, not four. Chances of picking a team, eh, 25%. But instead, we pretty much know who that worst team is, right? If there's four teams, you know who the worst team is, right? Of course. So what's the chance of picking the right team? One in three. What about our paid professional sports players who do this for a living and make millions and millions of dollars? What's their accuracy? Any, any guesses? 36%. I want that job. <laughs> I can flip a coin in the back, pick a one of three, and I'm still making millions of dollars. Some, I don't know, crazy. I don't understand. 
Oh, I'm a little tired here. Let's look at all the predictions of when the earth is going to end. Let me know when it's done. <laughs> there have been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of predictions of when the earth is going to end. And it's still going on. Let's take a look at some of the most recent ones. Yeah, they're still going out there. I didn't really, there's, if you ever heard of there's the second coming, this is the third time the second coming is coming. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't know how the math works on that. Uh, for those of you, Jesus, Jesus is coming back again um, next year I, on June 9th, so make sure you say hello. Um, Armageddon, that's it was it's supposed to happen in 2020, but we made a, a correction from 1962. They just got, it was close. Uh, Jesus is also coming back in 2021. Asteroids are going to destroy the Earth in 2026. And eventually, asteroids will destroy everything by 2113. That's less than 100 years. Um, anyone who recycles environmental, save the planet, are you, really, are you really worried about that? We're going to be not going to be here in 100 years. You're wasting your time. You need to stop. What is our accuracy of predicting the Earth is going to end? If you get this one wrong, I'm really going to be embarrassed. What's our accuracy for predicting the Earth being done? Zero percent. Wow, that's not very good. And that's been over hundreds and hundreds of predictions. So part of the challenge, or the, I guess the trick is, you want to predict far enough into the future so you can never be proven wrong. Um, in the U.S., we have something called NASA, a National Aeronomic Space Administration. I actually knew that one. That's where we, when we launch, um, we send the man to the moon and all of our rockets all come through this organization. Well, their prediction is four billion years. Four billion years from today. That's, again, I'm not too worried in my age. I, I'm not too worried about being here when that happens. You may also have heard of Stephen Hawking. Uh, he did pass away recently. His prediction was 600 years. So I have 100 years, 600 years, 4 billion years. I don't know who to believe. That's a pretty wide range. But I love the excuses when they get it wrong. These are actual quotes I found. Unpredictable fa factors, like the weather. No one else could have predicted it. Okay, that, I don't get that one. My prediction was right, but my timing was wrong. <laughs> I thought timing had something to do in prediction. I, I don't know. I don't. Now this one, I still can't understand it. The evidence was not incorrect, but was not fully predictive of what was going on. I tried to do Google convert that to Bulgarian. It, it broke. It just crashed. <laughs> I still don't know what that one means, so um, that's part of the challenge. We talk about fear. Earlier we heard about people and emotion and what factor that plays. 80% of the people think 50% of the jobs are going to disappear to robots. Pretty scary stuff. Except 80% of the people think it's somebody else's jobs. <laughs> that doesn't add up very well. So whose jobs are they? I don't know. So why are we so bad at predictions? The predictions that we see on TV are the crazy ones, the extreme. Lady Gaga puts a lobster in her head and everybody wants to take a photo of it. If I took a little, that's a yellow rubber ducky, if I go and I put that on a river somewhere, nobody cares. If somebody puts a really big rubber ducky on the river, everybody wants a photo of that. We, I can predict 100% the future. Sun's going to come up tomorrow. Do you think they're going to put me in a newspaper? No. Because what's interesting is the people who make one extreme prediction, they can have every other prediction wrong. The only thing they'll talk about is that one prediction they made right because it's extreme and it's crazy. What's our penalty to make a bad prediction? Is there anyone here from Romania? Okay, because I want to know, is this true? There's nothing for bad predictions, but is Romania going to punish people for two years in jail for bad predictions? Is that true? You're going to check on that? Good. Let me know by the end of the presentation, okay? I thought that was brilliant. What do you think that's going to do to the future of predictions if all of a sudden you go to jail because you make a wrong prediction? Do you think it might start changing something? I don't know. Where's my environmental friends? I saw a lot of hands here. I love this one on the left. I'll, let, I'll give you a second to read it. 
I know it's hard to read in the back. Right? We always hear about getting plenty of exercise, plenty of clean water, plenty of, plenty of, of air. But yet our cavemen, they, always, they never lived past 30 years old. There's got to be something else there, but I always just thought that was funny. Pyramid. There, there's a theme today. This was not planned. We saw pyramids in the last two opening presentations, the last presentation. You have, you have pyramids as well? No, you don't. The, the gentleman from uh, Cairo does not have pyramids in his presentation. I'm very... <laughs> I'm very disappointed. You didn't get the memo. <laughs> That was not planned. Right, Cleopatra, the pyramids versus the man walking on the moon. No protest? Because actually you're wrong. Cleopatra is actually closer to the man walking on the moon than she is to the pyramids by 700 years. Look at the dates. 2,700 B.C. for the pyramids. Cleopatra, 69 B.C. Man on the moon, 1969. But our perception, we always associate Cleopatra with the pyramids. Interesting. We're not very good at history. Okay, quick. What's her nationality? We all know that one, though. That's an easy one, right? What's her nationality? Greek. I know, not what you thought. Everybody thinks she's Egyptian. She was actually Greek. Uh, we don't know what we don't know. I just did, again, I like having a little bit of fun with math. We talk about the world's going to end, food problems. Seven billion people can fit within France with about 80 square meters per person. I think that's about four times, four sizes of Bulgaria together. So it kind of, yeah, it might be a little tight, but 80 square meters, that's not too bad. Kind of gives you a sense of the size of the world versus the size of the population. The United States alone, we can actually f feed nine billion, sorry, nine billion people. Um, just the U.S. alone. We can give back the size of France, back to nature, every single year for 100 years, and we can still feed everyone. Yeah, there's a crisis. There's, we have to pay attention to the environment. Things are happening, but maybe it's not as extreme as we may, we're always led to believe. We talk about population. London took 76 years to get back to their pre-World War II population. We always think, wow, the population just keeps growing and growing. They just got back to what their population was 76 years ago. Berlin and Paris, they're still lower than what their populations were um, back in World War II. It's always funny when you look at numbers and data, you get a different perception. A little hard to read, I apologize for the size, but on the right-hand side, I have different things about sizes. So I want to talk about humans and how good we are with numbers. So let's look at 10 to the, to the 16th power, or 10, sorry, 10 to the 6th power. That's the number of bugs, insects, for every single person. 200 million bugs for each of us. Where, I don't know, where, where do you keep your bugs? Do you keep them in a, okay. So 10 to the 9, we're gonna go up in order of magnitude. Let's see what's next on our list. Number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Okay, interesting. Let's go up a little bit higher. Number of trees on the Earth. It's a little bit of a surprise. More trees than the stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Hmm. Let's go up even higher. The number of synapses in our brain. Let's go up even higher. 10 to the 18th power now. Grains of sand on all the beaches in the world. All right, who's our scientist in the room? Avogadro's number, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd. We learned that in school. We had it memorized. The number of atoms for a tiny little single gram. And then certainly stars in the visible universe goes even higher. Not quite the order you might have thought about. We're not very good at understanding relative data. When we compare things, we get a whole different perspective of what we thought we know. Let's talk about our decision-making a little bit more as well. We make gut decisions. We talked about how that emotion impacts decisions. So artificial intelligence struggles with understanding human emotion. I could make a wife joke there, but my wife will kill me. Um, emotional appeal. This is something marketers have known this for years. Ladies, I apologize. This is true. If a pair of shoes is on sale for 100 lev, but if for 200 and they're on sale for 100 lev, you know you're going to buy those shoes, right? We have Black Friday today. We're going to have a lot of shopping today. 
that's exactly what marketers are going to do. They raise a price, and then they say it's on sale. It's the same price you would have paid probably last week. But that's what happens. That's how we are programmed to make relative decisions, not absolute decisions. So we struggle to make those absolute decisions. Let me give you another example. This is still true, The Economist, when they sell their magazine. Uh, they sell for about 100 lev a year for just the paper copy. The digital copy is about 207 lev. But I'll give you a great deal. I'll give you the paper and the digital for 207 lev. There's, there's no typo there. So how was the split? 10% of the people purchased the paper version. 90% purchased the combination. 0% bought just the digital version. OK. So what do we do? What does purchasing do? Well, let's get rid of that skew. Let's get rid of that middle one. We don't need it. Nobody bought it. OK. Let's get rid of it. What happened to the percentages of purchases? 60% now buy paper, 40% buy di paper and digital. Well, there's got to be something else going on there, right? There's got to be something that's, maybe it's the economy. Maybe, I don't know, there's a change in reading behavior. Let's add that middle one back in again. What do you think? It shifts back to 10 and 90%. In all three cases, no one bought the paper-only copy, but yet it affects our perception, it affects our decisions. That could be an area I think artificial intelligence can help us, because we're not very good at making those kind of decisions. But again, we make those relative decisions, and it's easy to understand the value of comparing the, the digital and the digital and paper versus comparing just the paper alone. So where does this leave us? What's it have to do with project management? I know, good question. You were thinking that. I know you were thinking that. It's OK. The world is changing. It's always changed. That's really what the message is. We're not very good at predicting the future. We have a horrible track record of predicting the future. But we're good at working together. We're good at coming together, helping each other, forming teams, working on problems together. And we have to think about how do we work better together? How do we communicate better? And how do we solve those problems better? Continual learning. What are we doing in our profession? Are we trying new approaches? Are we trying to improve things that we've done before? Are we continually learning about our industries? Or are we too busy to learn and improve? We have a phrase, well, that, we've always done it this way. Oh, I hate that phrase. And that's the kind of response that people get. We've always done it that way. We don't have time to improve. Scary. So project managers, again, I, we, we are all project management here. So what's changed in the last 10 to 20 years? You're allowed to talk. It's OK. What's, what, really? No, not technology. In project management specifically, what has changed in the last 10 to 20 years? Agile's come along, right? Big scary thing, this new thing, this agile stuff. But the funny thing is, when you start actually reading some of the Agile Manifesto, I wish we did some of these in our waterfall projects as well. Because it's not that far. I think somehow we've lost some of these things. Like, having people actually talk to each other and interact. How many times do we sit and we write a document, give it to legal, legal gives it to purchasing, they give it to another person, now we've got to send it back. I feel like I'm dancing up here. And then it comes back. We, we send this document back and forth. We don't understand it. People don't read it. And it takes a very long time. But if we could actually interact better, that would be more important. Sometimes we focus too much on documentation instead of, is the product working, especially for software? Does it work? Does the customer want the solution? Are they happy with the solution? There are the kind of terms we need to be discussing. And how do we respond to change? Change is actually a good thing. So I'm going to just show a couple, about six of the highlights of what are six of the 12 principles around Agile. This is not an Agile class. There's too many classes out there about Agile. But I just want you to kind of think about it maybe a little differently here. Certainly from a prioritization perspective, it's can we have smaller phases, more specific demos? Let's interact with that customer more. Let's not wait one year, two years before our customer sees what we're delivering and they say, no, I don't want that. That's not what I wanted. That's not what I thought. Let's bring in change management as part of the process. What a concept. We, w there's too many project managers that when we do change management or the customer changes their mind, we want to punish that person. Oh, it's bad. We can't change it. We have to keep it from happening. Why? 
If the customer wants it and the customer is going to pay for it, why do we care? If that's what our sponsor is asking for, how do we respond quickly and incorporate that change? Somehow, again, we've lost that. We have to stop them from making a change. I'm always saying, great, you want to make a change? Here you go. Here's my new bill. I'm going to write you a new bill, and that's okay. If you want the change, you pay the time, and you change the schedule, I'll make the change. Um, getting business people to interact closer to the team. What a concept. What a shock. Imagine if we could talk to our business people every two weeks, every week, every day. If you could sit next to the, your business person every single day, and you're sitting next to him, and you have an idea, or you have a, a question, and you turn over and say, oh, Mikael, can you... Can you look at this? Oh, okay. That's amazing. That feedback loop gets so tiny and so tight, you go so much faster. And I've seen this with Agile, is the speed acceleration is amazing when you do it properly. We're going to hear more about that as well later today, talking about safe and scaled Agile in other presentations. Getting people to talk more, we actually build more trust within the teams. And I think that's also important, is giving them an environment for people to interact and make decisions. Um, if we could also convey information by that face-to-face, -face, that helps. And then certainly, we have lessons learned in project management, typically at the end of a project. Isn't that a little late to help the project? We've worked for a year, maybe two years. Now we're going to de decide what we should have done a year or two ago. Agile actually builds that in every two weeks, if you do a two-week sprint for those. Every two weeks, you ask the question, how can we as a team do one or two things better for the next two weeks? What one or two things can we do better for the next two weeks? Imagine if we did that on our waterfall projects, how, how much better the waterfall projects would be. We wait until six months, nine months, a year, two years to, just, to say, here's all these lessons learned, let's put a document together, and what do we do with that document? We kind of follow it away somewhere. Sometimes we look at it, but most times we don't. PMs, the other skill set I think we bring to the table is our ability to speak clearly, to summarize information and present complicated data in a very simple way. We should be spending 80% of our time communicating, talking, sharing, understanding, asking questions, interacting with the team. If you're spending all day working on your schedule or working on documents, you're maybe not spending the best use of your time. Yes, there's a requirement, but it's better to understand the audience. What are we doing? What problems can you solve? How can we help this project go along faster? Certainly, let's be short to the point. Let's say what we mean. Let's mean what we say. That's actually a song in the US, believe it or not, too. Say what you mean, me. No, I won't sing. Where's our singer? <laughs> yeah, I know she's laughing at me in the back. I appreciate that, thank you. There goes my confidence. I'm shattered up here. So use simple words, don't use jargon, don't use complicated language. As project managers, do we do that? Yes, no, maybe, um, okay, yeah, a little kind of soft. So let's have a little bit of fun. I'm going to take a commercial break here first, though, because there really is something I'm, I'm very passionate about, is there's a de there is a dangerous chemical out there, and I, I do want to share this with everybody, because it, it is important to me, this thing called dihydrogen monoxide. It causes burns, um, it, it's, it's also called a uh, hydraulic acid, causes corrosion, uh, erosion, corrosion, a lot of different really nasty bad things. They use it in nuclear power plants. Um, it's in pesticides, it's, it's on our food. Uh, they find it in all the houses, it's, it's, it's just all over, it, it, it's amazing. Here's a couple other signs I want you to be careful of, right? They actually spray this on organic food. You're eating this stuff every time you eat organic food. It never biodegrades. They dump it in the rivers. All of our rivers here, every, everywhere around the world, they dump this in the river. It's amazing. This is what it does to metal and to pipes. Imagine what it does when you drink it. Ew, I, I don't know. And if you can't breathe it, you know, what's, what's it doing to you? They actually found one month of this bottle sitting on the shelf high concentrations of dihydrogen monoxide in this bottle a month later. It's horrible. And if you, if you get it on your hands, you can't wash it off. It's amazing. So I, would like to, I really would like somebody to, to, if somebody would sign this petition to help me ban this product. Is there anybody who would help me? Seriously. A, a few, about half the room maybe. I, I, I appreciate it. It really does mean a lot to me uh, what this product can do as we 
kind of break it down a little bit more here. So I appreciate you helping me to ban water. Let's go back to these slides and let's change the words a little bit here. Water is sprayed on organic crops. Water is dumped into the rivers. It's not biodegradable. Water can rust pipes. If it's not safe to breathe water, is it okay to drink it? Water bottles have found, a month after being on the shelf, there's a high concentration of water in that bottle. <laughs> and once you wash your hands, you can't, you can't wash it off. Once you can put water on your hands, you cannot wash the water off. This is what we do sometimes as project managers. We don't communicate very well, do we? We use complicated, difficult jargon language. We think we're being more clear. We think we're being more professional and very you know, serious and we're all excited. But this is what our customers do. They don't always understand that same language, especially computer IT, I'm in that same field. We have a whole separate language ourselves. This is the challenge, this is the problem that we run into if we're not clear, if we're not bringing that clarity. To me, that's one of our biggest value as project managers is bringing that clarity in our status reporting and the way that we're sharing information. Most executives take anywhere from 10 to 30 seconds to read a status report. The bigger the status report, what happens? The less time they read it. Has anyone seen that? Yes? Actually, a few hands. Wow, that's exciting. So who are we writing status reports to? Is it to the team? We're writing them to our sponsors and our stakeholders and people outside of the team. So if, if we're writing status reports that say, I met with Sue, I, uh, we, we had a meeting, that's probably not saying a whole lot. Are we talking more about, well, here's, here we are with the project, are we still on, on track? If we don't have our sponsor sign this document by next Friday, my project will start to be late. Now there's, a, there's an interesting entry in a status report. You think I'll get attention of my sponsor? The project will be late if my sponsor doesn't sign this document by Friday. I think I'll get his attention or her attention. So I always ask when I help project managers learn how to write. What do they need to understand? What are some of the keys of the key risks, the key issues? But we need to be reliable. We need to be the voice of truth. Otherwise, people will not come to us to find out the truth about the projects. If everything is green and everything is great, the sponsors will go somewhere else and they'll ask other people for information and they may not have the full picture. And all of a sudden, they're gonna have a very skewed view of what that project is. I like this one, this is something um, I like to share, people with, or share with people. Estimation also is such a, a critical component of our projects, but I don't think we take it as serious enough. If there's a project to say, I don't know, 10 months or 10 million lev, pick your it's okay. But I give you an estimate and says, oh, it's gonna be eight months or it's gonna be eight million lev. What do we say to that project when it comes in at 10? Well, we say, they're, they failed, they're horrible, fire the project manager, bring in a new team, they're all, all very bad. What if I gave you exactly the same, same project but a different estimate and said, oh, it's gonna be 12 months, it's gonna be 12 million lev, and we come in at 10. They're great, success, promotions all around, bonuses. But yet, in both cases, the project is still 10 months. <laughs> Our success and failure has a big component related to estimation. But as we talked about earlier, we're not very good at predicting the future either. So keep that in mind. Yeah, I know. Keep that in mind with when we do our estimates. It's, are we keeping our stakeholders aware of what's happening? Are they aware of where the project is? As things change, are we updating them and changing their expectations? Because it really does matter. That has a, such a huge factor of our success and failure of a project. I am not saying go spend more time and do more planning. That's one of the other fallacies I think we also make as project managers. If we're spending three, four, five, six months for a one month project, we're probably spending way too much time in the planning phase. So how do we incorporate different techniques to incorporate the change quicker, incorporate the updates faster into the changes that we're doing going forward? So, Starting to wrap up here, last few slides. We still need to work with people. That's still, I think, the key message. We have to build trust early and often. The more we build that trust within teams, 
the more strength we're going to have when there are problems on that, that project. Great phrase I love to use, help me understand. Can somebody help me with my pronunciation? I'm going to kill it if I try. How do I say that in Bulgarian? Oh my God, say that again? Mini nafis beta. Okay, good. Woo. Okay, do I get, I get a, okay. Thank you. Yeah, you're, now you're being too polite. That's funny. See, I can't repeat it now. But with that phrase, that's a great phrase to ask. Like, help me understand. Why, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? When I form new teams, I don't just say the names. How fast we go through? Everybody says a name, and I sit there and I go, I don't remember who that was. Why do we do that? Why do we start meetings in such a formal way that almost no one remembers the names? I ask questions. So tell me your name, tell me, tell me your favorite vacation, or tell me an interest, tell me a hobby. Um, we work with international teams, people from around the world. I pull up Google Maps, what town are you from? Let me, and we pull it up. If I come to your town, what's the one thing you would ask me to see? What's the one thing or one food restaurant you said you absolutely have to go to this place? It's an amazing when you start making that type of a personal connection with someone when you start asking about their family and their life and where they're from. We do this for all of our meetings as much as we can. If someone goes on vacation, I get super excited because the expectation is when you come back from vacation, you're showing photos of your trip. The, 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 the good photos, not the bad photos. I don't, I don't, I don't want to see the private ones, but I want to see. I want, what did you do? Where did you go? Tell me about it. What was exciting about it? And it's, it's amazing to see a team pull together and come together and share and evolve and relax with each other. Thank you, Card. This was uh, amazing. We had a lady in India, fantastic, fantastic developer. She did an amazing job, solved a very difficult problem. So I said, all right, I'm going to go buy a thank you card. I don't know, what's that like? 10 lev, maybe? I don't know, something like that. Went, bought the card. I signed it. We had... Seven locations, sorry, seven, yeah, seven locations in five time zones around the world. I took the card, mailed it, they mailed it, they mailed it, they mailed it, five, six, seven. Finally mailed it to her. It took about a month. But you know what? Every day, the day she received that card, we knew. We heard it in her voice. She got on the phone, hello. <laughs> oh, did something happen today? Yes, as a matter of fact, it did. The energy that she radiated from receiving this card was amazing. And it infected the rest of the team because they were waiting for her to get the card. And did she get it yet? I don't know. And that became a way that our team bonded together. It was so much fun. Of course, I also went and helped talk to her management and said, you need to give her a bonus. So we got her two bonuses and a promotion out of it over the one year of the project. But that's stuff we should be doing as well. She was an amazing resource. In some locations in India, the pay scale is not very good. So I went to the partner of the company and said, here's what I need you to do. Because I need to keep her happy because she's amazing on the team. You need to take care of your employee. If not, I'm going to hire her and I'm going to steal her from you. So she got two bonuses and a promotion out of that. I also do a team group photo. This is not my team. These are random people here. But. Um, we always hear, oh, do video, do video conferencing. But sometimes we only have a very short meeting, 10, 15 minutes every day. To set up video across five or seven sites becomes difficult. I create this PowerPoint slide. I put their names, their titles, and I send it to everyone. We have some people who are working from home. They put it on their wall. So every time they're talking, it's hard to ignore somebody when you're looking at a face and having a conversation. It's difficult, isn't it? You're going to remember me from the rest of your life, aren't you? <laughs> but it's amazing that connection that you bring. Now, I'm going to, ugh, okay. Uh, you remember that connection when you're looking at someone's face. It's hard to ignore a face. It's easy to ignore a voice on the phone. So by sharing that, we understand each other better. When people come on site, we finally have teams. We bring ourselves together. We're the only team that people run up and give hugs and, hi, how are you? Good to see you but we've never met. The first time we're meeting, it feels like it's been the hundredth time that we've met because we've already had that relationship through a photograph, something as simple as that, very low cost, low technology. So conclusions, don't worry. That's, that's really the key message. Things have been changing last 10, 20, 50, 100, 1,000 years. Yes, this one's gonna be bumpy, this one's gonna be crazy with robotics, with automation, yes it is.
The top 10 jobs did not exist 10 years ago. We heard a little bit about that earlier as well. Okay, they didn't exist 10 years ago. At one of the universities, they, I, I teach at Villanova University, we hear the same concept of, we're currently preparing students for jobs that don't yet exist, using technology that has not been invented, in order to solve problems that we don't even know their problems yet. So we cannot teach a skill set, we have to teach a mindset. How do people think? How do they approach a problem? How do they solve a problem? How do we come together and work better together as a group? That's the kind of skills that we need to develop, train, and teach that going forward. I'm sorry, beware of the predictions made by professionals. I'm sorry. Uh, don't assume they understand the future better than we do. Don't assume we're geniuses either. You know, all we can do is respond to what we have. Certainly predictions are, are you know, they're, maybe they're not much better than a guess. But typically what we read about in the news and in the press are all the ones that are the crazy stories, the, the crazy things that are about to happen. Um, I don't know, let's go back and see what their accuracy is. Wrapping up here, we still need to build trust, we still need to work as a team, we still need to communicate simpler. That's the value I think we bring as project management. Continue to stay relevant. If you're not learning every day, you're not learning what's going on in the industry, what's happening in project management, what's happening in trends, getting involved in groups like this, it's amazing. That's the important part. Some of you laughed when I was walking around in the beginning saying hello and welcoming you. And How did that feel? How felt good. I spent, I don't know, two, three seconds just walking up to random people saying hello, welcoming you in there but I made, I made you feel different. It didn't cost me anything. Two, three seconds of my time. We're a volunteer organization here. Imagine going back and thanking our volunteers. Did everyone here, did you go out and thank your sponsors? If you wanna have a little bit of fun today, do this for me today. During one of the breaks, every one of you go up and thank the sponsors for being here. There's nine sponsors, thank them. They'll think you're crazy. You walk up and have, they're gonna have 600 people say thank you. It, it, you're going to change their day today. Try that. But what are we doing to our teams and thanking and building that relationship? Key stuff. But in conclusion, we need to adapt, adopt, in order for to, to thr thrive through all of the changes that are coming. What would that I think I have about a minute left and a half. I apologize. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paladino. Does the audience have questions? Uh, I will remind you that you can always ask questions during the breaks, too. So give me a big round of applause for Mr. Mike Paladino. Thank you. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I will remember you for a long time. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mike.